Hi, and here we are at exercise three of Fundamentals of Mocha, where we look at how planar tracking works. So let's start up our first uh, project. Let's uh, start a new project up here. I'm gonna choose my clip and choose slider one here. And it's gonna ask me what I'm gonna save my project file. Now I've got this set up in preferences to save my results right next to the original source clip and it's saving it in the results here. Um, we could have this saved in a specific network folder if you wanted to, but for my sake, I'm just going to save this relative to the original source material. I can choose in my options if I want to bring in a uh, specific frame range or if I'm going to bring in the whole thing, I can just do it there. Now Mocha will detect the, the frame range and the frame properties as much as possible. Uh, it's worth always checking them through just to make sure. So my frame rate is 25 frames a second. The pixel aspect ratio is HD, so I'm working in square pixels. If we're working in standard definition footage, you will want to make sure you're working at the correct type of standard definition here. And this all depends on where you're gonna be taking your data afterwards. So if you're taking it out to something like Final Cut or Motion, then you'll want to be using the regular PAL or PAL anamorphic NTSC or NTSC anamorphic ratios here. If you're taking it out to the Adobe suite, then you'll be wanting to work with the CS4 standard definition um, pixel aspect ratios here, because these are the ones that are generated for um, CS4 and above of After Effects. So we've got a slightly different aspect ratio. Let's check, check it out here. The pixel aspect ratio for PAL is 0.75 and for CS4 PAL, it's 0.769218. So this might not seem like a big difference, but when you take your tracking data over into After Effects and it doesn't match up properly, you'll see it makes all the difference in the world. Now actually the pixel aspect ratio here, uh, set this back to HD to, uh, to one there. Yeah, the pixel aspect ratio here actually can be changed uh, at a later stage in the, um, in the process. What can't be changed is this separate field. So if you're working with interlaced footage, you'll want to make sure that that gets done now. You can always swap whether it's gonna be upper field first or lower field first, you know, halfway through. What you can't do is once we've said that we don't want uh, uh, separate fields, so our interlaced is off and we're working with progressive footage, you can't then change that to track interlaced footage afterwards. You'll need to restart your project. So just make sure that is, uh, is set up correctly before you move on. I'm going to hit OK. And let's change my uh, name up here. We're not looking at big real life demo footage. What we're looking at is stuff that is going to help you to see how uh, the Mocha Tracker works and what to do to, uh, to get out of certain situations. So the, the footage itself is going to be quite basic, but they do provide challenges for both the tracker and for you as the artist. Now, as we look through the shot, it's actually a fairly straightforward camera move. We are moving from left to right, and our three postcards in different distances are moving along with us. So this should be a fairly straightforward thing to track. But let's have a look at how the planar tracker works. Now, we saw in the previous exercise how to draw a shape, so I'm gonna come up to my X-spline here so what I want to do in this first one is I just want to track this uh, this card in here. Now what I can do is try and treat this like a, a point tracker and just make a, a very small shape to uh, to track in here. So this is sort of like the equivalent of uh, of the little small feature that I'm I'm working on. And if we come down to the bottom of the viewer here, we've got our start frame of the project, our end frame of the project and our current frame here. So as I scrub through here, we can see what's going on. I can um, create frame ranges if I want to, using the ranges here, create project ranges. So we're only looking at a small part of the footage and I can uh, zoom in to just that small area here by using this button to zoom my timeline to my in and out point or I can zoom out to the entire frame, uh, the entire footage by clicking on the button next to it and reset those project in and out points using these buttons right here. I also have the general VTR buttons going on. 
So go to win point, uh, play backwards, one frame backwards, stop, one frame forwards, play forwards, and go to out point. And this final button here just uh, tells us what's going to happen when we reach the the end, either at the uh, beginning or the end. Uh, it's a playback mode, so at the moment it's set to ping pong. We can have it set to loop. So when it gets to the end, it just starts at frame one again. Boom, or we can have it just playing through once. So once it gets to the end, it's just going to stop. Now, my normal way of working is to have things set to ping pong, which is the first one here. So that when it gets to the end, it's just going to play it backwards and then forwards again. Uh, this actually helps out quite a lot when we're doing sort of roto work. And I want to be checking what's going on at the uh, at the edges of the frame. It just makes it a lot easier to, to check those sort of things. We, we're ping ponging it back and forth. The next set of buttons here, they look like our VTR buttons, but they're controlling the track. So we can track backwards, track one frame backwards, stop the track, track one frame forwards, and track forwards completely. So I track forwards completely. Let's see what happens. I haven't touched any of the other parameters uh, going on down here. I've just drawn my little shape and I'm tracking that forwards. And let's stop that here. And you see as it tracks forwards, my line goes from red to blue, which signifies the fact that we've tracked those frames in. And let's have a little look. It looks as if that's tracked in quite nicely. But actually, here's one of the biggest things if you've only just started uh, looking at Mocha. And that's the fact that our shape data isn't what is taken out as our transform data, our tracking data. In fact, this shape data here can, can move around and do completely crazy things. But the tracking data that's underneath that shape can be, uh, can be very solid and very different to what you're seeing here. So the way to see what the tracking data is doing is to use our surface. And if we come up here and click on my planar surface here, what this is, it's a blue box that is our four corner pin, or it's the equivalent of a four corner pin. So it's the four points that describe our plane. So remember the plane that we had is our infinitely thin 2D shape. Well, here it is. It's just four corners. And we can see if I just actually I'll take this over here to the end of that, the bit where we've, we've tracked it out. Just play that back. You can see that even though I've only tracked out this one tiny little uh, part of this large postcard, we've actually got a decent track going on or a decent equivalent track going on for the rest of the card here. It's not perfect. You can see at the end that our surface points here are slipping, but it just goes to show the power of the planar track and how that by, by tracking textures rather than points, that gives us a, a whole range of, um, of advantages over normal point trackers. So what Mocha is actually doing here, and if I turn on my, my planar grid here, we'll take this and look at this again, plane that back. You can see I've got a bit of jitter going on on the track, so we can see it's not great, but we've generated out uh, quite an interesting, quite a large track out of a very small piece of data. And this goes to, to really the fundamentals of how the plane tracker is working. I'll turn my, my grid and my surface off and I'll come back to those in a moment. What's going on is we're not tracking just a, a point here. We're tracking this texture. So as this texture moves and changes and, tr and transforms, Mocha tries to work out and extrapolate the entire movement of the, the plane that's working on, on here. So if I give this a bigger texture to work on, we'll take this to the, uh, to the edges here. I'm going to right click at the corners to make all of my points slightly sharper. And I just track that through again. Again, I'm not touching any of the other uh, parameters. We'll come to those in a moment. I'm just going to track this through. 
And if I turn on my surface again, you see my surface actually hasn't changed. I've changed the shape, but that hasn't changed the surface. I turn my, um, my grid back on here. Uh, the grid and the surface are actually tied together. So you can't move the grid independently of the, uh, of the surface. Uh, the grid is really just another um, useful tool to make sure that everything that you've got is, uh, is actually uh, rock solid and working properly. And let's play that back. You should be able to see straight away that we're getting a much um, better track going on here just by making sure that uh, the Mocha has a bit more data to work from. So you can see that grid now is steady. My points are nicely aligned still throughout the, uh, the whole of that track. So let's turn my surface and my grid back off. And let's come down now to my track parameters. And we have the, uh, the input, which is the input clip, which is set to my, well, set to the clip that I imported, which is where you'll generally want to keep it. If you are working on uh, interlaced footage, you do have the ability to track individual fields if you want to, which does, you've got fast moving footage, you know, you've got a, a car racing down the road, which is changing rapidly with, the, with every field. You might get a better um, track coming in by tracking the individual fields. But, you know, nine times out of 10, if you are working with interlaced footage, you can happily leave that turned off and you'll get uh, the same quality of track in just half the time. We have the input channel now, which is going to be the channel that, that Mocha is going to be looking at to try to, to find out the texture. So it's either going to create a, uh, yeah, pick up the luminance, or it's going to look through the different color channels and see which of those gives the, the best contrast. So that's going to be the auto channel here. And if we take a look at this in, uh, in After Effects, you can see this would be the luminance channel. Or we can check out the red, green, and blue channels here to sort of get an idea of what, uh, of what Mocha will see when trying to look through the different channels. Probably some of the best results here could be found by, by looking at the individual color channels so we can send this to auto channel here instead of luminance and see what happens at that stage. Now the minimum percentage of pixels used is the, I'd say probably the most important uh, single effect or single parameter that you can change. Because it's this value here that Mocha is gonna use to say, okay, I've got my shape, my texture in frame one and it's this that I'm now gonna look for in frame two. And only when I've matched this percentage of pixels used between those two frames, am I gonna be happy that I've got a good match and then move on? Again, let's, let's pop into After Effects and see how this is gonna work. Now I'm gonna duplicate up my slider here and just freeze frame this. And I'm then gonna set my, my blend mode to, to difference here. Because the duplicate, uh, duplicated layer is exactly the same as the layer underneath, we've got a completely black clip. If I move on to the next frame and things have moved off a little bit, you can see I don't have a black clip anymore. It's showing me the difference between the two frames. And I'm just nudging that a little bit there. I wanna make sure I've got the least amount of difference between these two, and then I can move on again. And then again, I'm just going to go and move on until I find the least amount of difference. Then I can move on. And essentially, this is what Mocha is doing. It's going through and it's trying to look at our texture here and trying to match it up in the next frame. And when it's found the, uh, the right number of pixels or our minimum percentage of the pixels, it then says, good, let's move on to the next frame and do the job again. And the motion here are the techniques that it uses to try and make that match. So we just have translation turned on. It's only going to be doing X and Y movements. So it's only going to be trying to reposition it in X and Y. With scale turned on, it's going to be adding scale into the mix. With rotation, 
it's also going to be adding rotation and shear and perspective are so important that I'm actually going to be looking at that in a separate um, tutorial. So we're going to be looking at that in a later exercise. So a large motion turned on, it's going to be searching around the frame, around the area that it was before to try and find the match. With small motion turned on, it's not going to be doing that same search. So this is great when we've, we're just trying to, uh, to track something like a little bit of camera shake. Uh, the camera's mounted on a tripod, we've got wind blowing, and the camera's just moving just ever so slightly. So turning on the small motion just ensures that we don't look too far for, uh, for any sort of jitter. So we get a nice, um, accurate little effect there. But in this case, we know that we're going to have uh, a decent amount of motion. We've got, we can see that in the image, so I'm going to turn the large motion on there. Manual track's only really used when, um, when all hope is lost. Um, so it really is the sort of final stage of trying to get some decent results on a, on a particular track. Uh, it just means you're doing it yourself. I find myself using this uh, very, very rarely. And popping over onto the, uh, the search area here, currently these are both set to auto for horizontal and vertical, but this is really just how far Mocha is going to be looking to try and find our texture when large motion is turned on. Auto does a, uh, a good job most of the time. If you're having uh, difficulty tracking a particular object, you might want to turn auto off and scrub in numbers that you want here. Uh, and in that way, you can find yourself getting a, a more accurate track. So for example, in something here where there's very little vertical motion, we can take our vertical motion down quite low, maybe to 20 here. Uh, and we know that um, it's not going to be sort of searching up high and low for our, for our particular shape. Angle and zoom, we will be looking at in later exercises. So let's just extend this out a little bit more and I'm going to retrack everything that I've tracked in before. I can turn on my surface if I want to, to, uh, to make sure that things are uh, looking okay as we're tracking through. So by its very nature, the, the shapes themselves are a lot more fluid than the, the surface is. Um, the surface describes the plane, but we can animate the shapes up to, uh, to aid with tracking. It's going to be completely independent to the, the track that we need. And we'll see this explored in a little bit later in, in a bit more detail. It's important to, to register right at the very beginning that there is that separation between shape and surface. And its surface is the one that we, uh, we really want to look for. Now, just with translation turned on, we've got a decent result out of it. Let's uh, turn off my zoom windows for a second so you see this. It's not a perfect result, as you can see, and we can test that by coming over to our layer properties over here, coming to our insert clip, maybe inserting a logo. Turn off my transform tool and my overlays here. And the reason it's not a perfect match is because the uh, the type of movement that we've got going on here, because the card itself is not dead straight onto us, because it's at a very slight angle, you can see there. Yeah, because it's not dead straight onto us, just by having the translation on, we don't get that very subtle movement in perspective that's happening here. Cool, in the next exercise, what we're gonna be looking at is how we can track in this background card here. And this offers a few challenges for us, but it's something that Mocha absolutely excels in. But that's gonna be in exercise four.